and welcome to our conversation today with Dr. Carla Steingraber. Uh, Dr. Steingraber is a licensed clinical psychologist. She is also a certified mental game coach. And those two things together uh, are often referred to as sports psychology. Uh, we are also joined today by Dr. Joseph Aliva, who is a physiatrist and also competitive in jujitsu. My name is Deanna Schaas, and our conversation today will focus on the mental and physical manifestations of injury, and if I may add, with that added element of post-40. So welcome to both of you. I'm delighted for our conversation. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We're welcome. So I know what a physiatrist is because I got to see one after I had back surgery years ago. And I think you're the most like amazing doctors that ever existed, particularly if people are are act physically active and, and athletes. But can you tell people, I don't know if that happens to you where people say, well, what's a physiatrist? Can you explain what that all, is? All the time. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, the discipline is physical medicine and rehabilitation. So it divides it into two parts. The physical mm -hmm. medicine aspect is taking care of orthopedic and spine issues non-surgically. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. the rehabilitation aspect is dealing with people and their disabilities and trying to maximize their function. So spinal cord injured patients, brain injury patients, stroke patients, and the like. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about it is it seemed to focus on not just I'm going to fix the spine or I'm going to fix the body part that has problems, but looking at how that body part is used in, you know, activities of daily living or for people who are athletes in, in the goals that they have for the athletic performance. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I also understand that you practice jujitsu competitively. Can you I tell do. us a little bit? Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So I, I've been doing some sort of combative sport for lack of better terms since mm -hmm. I was probably six. My brother um, was a golden glove champion. So I was his mm -hmm. pinata for about six years. <laughs> um, I got into uh, karate almost like everybody did. And I got mm -hmm. my black belt in that. I had some amateur fights in kickboxing. And then I delved into a little, little bit of judo. And mm -hmm. then I saw UFC and became interested in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And mm -hmm. I've been doing that for the past 15 years. Oh, wow. And Carla, you also do some competitive sports. Yeah, mostly running. And it's, it's really much more on a personal level with personal records and things like that. And I've certainly engaged in different challenges like the 10,000 kettlebell swing challenge and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Going back to Joe for a minute, it sounds like you have that, that urge for competition kind of in, in part of your body makeup. I understand that you, and the way I wrote the question was fight to win. What the heck? Oh, because <laughs> I understand that's a pretty intensive, those are pretty intensive competitions. Yeah. So it's just, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is, is almost like wrestling, mm -hmm. except, you know, you win either by points, much like they do in wrestling, or mm -hmm. you win by submitting your opponent. Maybe you get them into a chokehold or some mm -hmm. sort of point lock and then they, they submit it. So it's almost like a knockout. And most of the organizations that uh, you compete in are amateur and fight to win is, is a professional uh, venue um, so that you, you get to do that. So, so yeah, I've done one of those. It didn't mm. go over well. <laughs> <laughs> are there other, so then when you compete, are there other than competitions that you participate in? Yeah. So the most, the um, International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation mm -hmm. is pretty much the biggest governing body mm -hmm. of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So they have amateur tournaments that are taking place throughout the year in, in various um, areas in the United States. Mm -hmm. But then they have the big competitions like the uh, Pan Am and the World Championships. And those are the ones that I mostly show up for because, quite frankly, there's not a lot of people over 50 that are mm -hmm. in the smaller events. Um, so, so those are the ones that I really prepare for. 
Mm -hmm. So this is fascinating, both from the fact of how demanding being a doctor is. I imagine being a doctor is very demanding, um, but then also maintaining your physical fitness to be ready for competition. Uh, and you're now saying post 50. So I guess one, so that's two questions. How do you balance the, the full-time professional life with maintaining your physical fitness at a competitive level? And then I'd love to hear how being a competitor or being uh, involved in sports has changed as you age. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think having a, a competition looming in the future keeps me motivated to work out in the first place. Mm -hmm. I have a family history of coronary artery disease. So for me, mm -hmm. exercising is important. So I have several incentives to kind of stay in shape, but I do like competing. Um, it's hard to balance the two. One of the advantages I do have is, you know, I, I don't have a wife and children, so it's it's mm -hmm. easier for me. So I get up in the morning and I usually do my workout for strength and conditioning. And then in the evening, I usually do sports specific training, whether it be judo or jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And, and much seven days a week. Oh, seven days a week. I wonder, just focusing a little bit on what Carla does with the mental game coaching and the whole mind part of exercise, maybe Carla first, if you can share, you know, what do you think goes into helping athletes stay in that mental space that you need to be in from a clinical point of view? And then Joe, maybe you can share what that looks like uh, between the physical and then the mental capacity to, to be that strong. Well, there are multiple things that are relevant. Um, one piece of it, of course, is having something in your life outside of the athletic realm, whether it is your profession, your career, mm -hmm. or whether it's some kind of meaningful hobby outside of that. Since things do happen, like you get injured and then you might not be able to practice or play or mm -hmm. engage in that sport for a while. So how do you find the rest of your time meaningful outside of mm -hmm. the time you're spending in sport? But certainly there are things you can do to really enhance your preparedness for events or even for a training. Uh, we'll call it getting into the zone or mm -hmm. dealing with a focus funnel. So there are all kinds of fun names for stuff like that on how to get uh, invested, motivated, focused for mm -hmm. an event or even for a practice. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, Joe, you had some physical things like coronary heart disease in your family, but are there other things that you do to, to get yourself mentally psyched to, uh, for that level of practice and fitness? Yeah. So I, I remember reading this book, Heart of a Champion, which was a book that was mm -hmm. written. He wanted to explore how um, the high-end athletes prepare mentally for their event. Mm -hmm. So he interviewed what he felt to be the top competitors in various disciplines like boxing, mm -hmm. uh, kickboxing. It was, it was uh, you know, based on combative sports. And the, one of the conclusions out of the book was if, you're physic if you physically prepare and you physically train, then, then you show up with a degree of confidence that, that mm -hmm. you're prepared for it. But I'm going to admit um, my mental game is horrendous. Um, oh, really? <laughs> you know, I did meet with a, a, a sports psychologist, a caller, mm -hmm. if I knew you did this, I probably would have come to see you instead. Mm -hmm. But I met with, with someone in Illinois and I, I, know, I did some of the tools that she was giving me, I didn't buy into. So I didn't really feel like it, mm -hmm. I, it gained much traction with me. Um, but the thing is, is, you know, when I'm training, I'm, I, I'm, uh, with the people at my gym, so on and so forth. I really feel confident. I feel good. And then my level of confidence just takes a nosedive when I compete. And what happens is oh, I get a, an extremely slow start in, mm -hmm. in a fight. And then once I'm starting to lose, then I rev up and then I rally. But by then it's too late. You know, I've lost points. Mm -hmm. I'm in a disadvantageous position, so on and so forth. So that is something, you know, I would love to improve, but it's, it's, uh, it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm the obvious well, I have next, ideas for you. I was just going to say that was the obvious <laughs> next question. Carla, what would you recommend for yeah. show in that situation? Yeah. <laughs> well, so, you know, there, there are two aspects of this. Of course, there's the one side that is purely mental game coaching. And that part is, uh, let's call it very structured, um, a little bit formulaic, uh, totally relevant, but formulaic. Uh, nonetheless, it's sort of like if you want to lose weight, you need to eat less. It's pretty pretty simple, structured, straightforward, total face validity, etc. cetera. Um, some people get wowed by it because they've never thought of trying something in a slightly different way. And certainly you need uh, Dumbo's feather to help you fly sometimes. Mm. Um, and all of it is real. I mean, it has a real effect. But then there's the other piece, which is the psychological piece, which I always find really fascinating because even if you start to go into the neuroscience research, um, they keep coming back to there's this thing called the unconscious and that drives everything. And they haven't been able to define it any better than Sigmund Freud did in the late 1800s. So mm. it's really there. And just generally speaking, and Joe, I can't speak for you whatsoever, but very often, um, people who are generally very successful feel bad about winning. And that's definitely something that you can start to work on is um, embracing the the will to win and what it means when, when you basically make somebody else lose. So people who are successful professionally or successful mm -hmm. in their yeah. sport, successful professionally, then don't like to, uh, are well, uncomfortable winning. Yeah, right, yeah, especially mm -hmm. if they're competing against people they like. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting dynamic. And I, again, I, I don't know about you, Joe, mm -hmm, but sure. um, jujitsu is a pretty small community. So inevitably, you get to know everybody pretty quickly. So and I feel like what happens, I don't want to turn this into a session. <laughs> I feel like what happens, it's, it's actually, I feel like because I'm a physician, because I work full time, and, and at the level that I am, because I'm a black belt, most of the my opponents who I don't know because most of them are from out of the country, uh -huh. um, they own their own schools and they do this all the time. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's a different yeah. Then, yeah. I show up and that doubt enters my head. I'm like, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm in the morning and in the afternoon, I'm training seven days a week. I'm doing really well, but I, there's no way I'm going to beat this guy. He's doing this full time. He's doing it for a living. And that just lives in my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that's something where you can you can work on turning that around. Yeah, I have. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit more about injury, just because as people age, they it strikes me that people are a little bit more prone to injury. Plus, the nature of what you do as a physiatrist, people are coming to see you because they have an injury. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, it can set people back. I think, Carly, you mentioned it earlier, the idea of just even that you can't train. You must hear mm -hmm. people say like, I'm going to be so out of shape because I can't train for as long as it takes to recover. So how do you work with people both physically to get them better? But what are some of the, the mental manifestations that you see of, of people when they're working through injury? Well, I definitely see the depressive aspect or the anxiety mm -hmm. too, kind of like you're referencing, Deanna, where... Um, feeling like they're going to lose all the gains they've made. And to some extent that it's true, your, your mm -hmm. muscles will start to atrophy and, but you don't lose absolutely everything. So there's something to be understood about that. And you can get it back once you can start training again. And there might be uh, different kinds of physical therapy exercises you can do to compensate in the meantime. I think there's a lot of truth to the endorphins that are released uh, for people who exercise regularly, compete regularly, and the loss of that leads to depression and the, and the, and the desire to get back to exercising. I try to explain to people this is a, um, a short-term uh, loss uh, and for bigger gains later on, and that prevention will become a big part of their life, um, and this will be a learned experience. And um, usually, based on depending on what I'm looking at, I can give them some sort of prognostic uh, indication to say, "I don't. This is not going to end your career. This is just mm -hmm. going to be, you know, a bump in the road, and then we'll move forward from it." We also try and define things that they could do in the interim. That that is sport specific, just maybe not as exertional as what they were doing. 
Um, so, so we do a lot of things to try and keep them going. There's a great book on this subject actually called How Bad Do You Want It by Matt Fitzgerald. He's a marathon runner and he um, pursued different athletes who had a career ending event or uh, a career changing event or they got to their big event that they'd been training for basically mm -hmm. their whole life and it did not go well mm -hmm. and uh, how they eventually turned it around and mind you sometimes there was a real crash um, and it took a while to yeah. rebuild but there was even a guy who lost an arm in the process mm -hmm. and ended up still becoming a successful triathlete so swimming with one arm biking with one arm Wow. Really difficult. Yeah. It's actually amazing how people do it. And of course, it strikes me there when you look at the mental game coaching, there's got to be something going on that that inspires people to find to find that. But do you even find it? And I'm going back to um, uh, to you, Joe, you know, you mentioned again, being over 50 now and being competitive. How do you think your mind changes as you age related to expectations you have for your own physical performance? Yeah, I mean, most of the people I train with are younger than me. And so I have a I have a realistic approach that, that they're going to be faster than me. They're going to be stronger than me, mm -hmm. that I need to create a game that that tries to compensate for that. And there are things that you can do in jujitsu to slow down an athletic, com uh, you know, competitor. Um, and, you know, but there's also things that I can do for myself to increase my aerobic capacity and my mm -hmm. physical capacity as best I can. I like to say that, you know, the, the people around me, they train, but I'm, I, if I haven't given the impression already, I, I can grind. And so mm -hmm. I can train pretty hard as well, but mm -hmm. training smart is important. And so I do a lot of cross training. Mm -hmm. A lot of rehabilitative exercises. I don't have the best neck. I don't have the best back. I don't have the best shoulder and I don't have the best knees, but I do a lot of re preventative rehabilitation. Um, I don't do some of the crazy things that, that the younger guys do, meaning throwing mm -hmm. around heavy weights. I try to be kind to my body and I feel that, that that gets me a lot of mileage. That probably leads to my final question, which is because we're talking about the mental and physical manifestations of, of exercise, but of injury as well, and particularly as we age. So what advice would you give to people who have been physically active, who are now aging and want to maintain that level of fitness? What pieces of advice that you would give people in that category? Well, I, actually jumping off the last thing you said, I think being kind to yourself is important, both physically, um, also managing your nutrition intake and things like that so mm. that your body's in the best position to perform and recover and feel good. But also psychologically speaking, so often people are self-critical that they, they can't do what they once could sure. do. They don't look how they once looked. And these are just really the natural processes of life. Um, and just being kind to yourself and being proud of what you can do since, you know, if you really look around, there are a lot of people who choose not to. I would say I get a text maybe once a month from someone who considers themselves old, but they're not quite as old as I am. And they, <laughs> they'll say, you know, Joe, how, how are you doing this? Um, I'm in my late thirties or I'm in my early forties and these younger guys are crushing me and it's, um, tearing my ego apart. What do you do? You know, part of it is choosing the right partner to train with because there are people out mm -hmm. there that fortunately or unfortunately do take advantage of weakness and 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 go hard mm -hmm. and you're gonna the older person is gonna be the person that more likely comes up with the shorter end of the stick and gets injured so i think choosing the right partners to train with i think cross training is very important not doing too much of one thing because older people are more prone to overuse injuries having some sort of rehabilitative program that you adhere to depending on what body part has been giving you problems and i think all of those things go a long way mm -hmm. that's, what I, that's what i do mm -hmm. And I would say having a good relationship with someone who is like a physiatrist or physical therapist or someone that if you're starting to feel something that you can check in with, same thing, actually, if you're starting to, if that inner voice is getting too loud, yeah. it's good to probably have both of you on on dial for whatever you need at a, <laughs> at a particular time. But I think Paul is 100% correct. I, I don't know the exact solution to this. But mm -hmm. you're getting older and there, there's just things you, you just got to get your arms around the fact that are, you're not going to be mm -hmm. able to do some of the things that you did when you were 20. Maybe there's mm -hmm. some things. Maybe you're smarter. Maybe you have a wiser game. Maybe you have a more tactical game. Um, mm -hmm. But there's not going to be things that you could do physically 
that you were able to do. And you have to get your head around that. And if you don't, you're, you're going to spin your wheels sometimes. Thank you both. So if you want to reach Dr. Joseph Oliva, you are with the North Shore University Health System. And Dr. Carla Steingraber is with Everest Strong Coaching. So for either of those things, for people who are maintaining their physical fitness really at a competitive level, uh, you know, reach out and get the help you need. And thank you both so much for sharing such wonderful insights to help people in this journey. Thank you. Thank you.